Given the amount of time that they put into The Last of Us Part 2, it's probably not difficult to conceptualize. It's got some stuff to hide. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 Last of Us Part 2 Easter Eggs and Secrets. Starting off at number 10, it's Ellie's Room. One of the first things you see in this game is Ellie's room in Jackson, the town she and Joel found themselves in at the end of the first game. As you would expect, it's jam-packed with little references and details. Probably the most prominent is the blue robot toy on the shelf next to her desk. Anybody who has played the first game will recognize that as the toy Ellie gave to Sam, another kid around her age during the Pittsburgh section of the game. He died at the end of that part, and Ellie later complains that she forgot to put the stupid toy on his grave. I assume she just got rid of it, but I was wrong. She kept it the whole time. Another obvious one is the Savage Starlight poster above her desk. That's the title of the comic book Joel could collect during the first game. They amounted to another kind of collectible, but that was cool to see the different artwork on each one, which was all done by the comic book artist Mike Oming. It looks like they got him back to do the poster, and if you're a fan of his artwork, then it's fun to see the return here. Another funny thing you can find in Ellie's room, a fat PlayStation 3 with two controllers and two games. First, the Jack and Daxter collection, and of course, the original Uncharted. A funny detail about this game is that apparently the outbreak started in 2013, so all the calendars stop on 2013, and the newest console anyone had was, of course, the PlayStation 3. I mean, the newest Sony console. It's not like they're going to put an Xbox in the game. You'll actually eventually find a few more PS3s laying around with some Naughty Dog games and then like Uncharted 2. The last big reference to the first game is pretty well hidden, though. Like, you look at this shelf and you see a few books. It's really dark at first, but if you focus and really look, that's the joke book Ellie has in the first game. She actually finds it in Left Behind, the prequel DLC, while exploring a mall with her friend Riley. And that's where we actually see the joke book is called, no pun intended, Volume 2, T-O-O. -O. The just bad jokes from this thing were a highlight from the first game, so it's fun to see that she still has it. You want to hear a joke about pizza? Never mind, it was too cheesy. I don't get it. Yeah, me neither. At number nine, there is a hidden reference and a porno title. This is a bizarre one that passes by pretty quickly, so you might not notice it. But when you get to the library outside of Jackson, You'll find a hidden basement area where an old lookout named Eugene used to grow weed. You'll find a lot of dead leaves, of course, but there's something else in there too, some, uh, well, nasty old man porno. One of the titles is, and pay close attention here, Smash Brandy's Cooch, which, yeah, Crash Bandicoot, right? Sounds familiar, right? Yeah, it's pretty bizarre to see their flagship PS1 franchise referenced in a fake porn, but definitely surprise. And Crash did get a nice callback where you actually get to play the original game in Uncharted 4. In general, it's cool to see a big studio like Naughty Dog embrace their past like that, even in pretty weird but amusing ways like this. At number eight is giraffe references. In that same library, there's another object you can find that's a bit of a callback, this stuffed giraffe, if you remember the original game. One of the more memorable moments is when you first get to Salt Lake City near the end of the game and have a chance encounter with a wild giraffe that presumably escaped the Salt Lake City Zoo. This moment has been stuck in the minds of Last of Us fans ever since, and it's cute to see them add this little callback in the sequel. The object itself isn't a direct callback, it's just a stuffed giraffe, but after you look at it, Ellie will sketch in her journal, it looks a lot closer to the specific scene from the first game. There's actually another reference to the giraffe scene later in the game during a flashback where you play a younger Ellie. It's a dinosaur this time and you can put a hat on it. Anyways, it was a touching scene in the original and these are of course some fun callbacks. And number seven, the sick Parvis Magna Ring. When you first get to the Seattle QZ, you're given a pretty large area to explore. In the far corner of the map, you can find a bank and learn the details of a failed bank heist that occurred on the outbreak day. In the bank vault, you'll find something pretty handy too, a shotgun. But if you explore the lockboxes, there's something else to find, a surprisingly detailed ring. Fans of the Uncharted series will recognize it immediately. It's Nathan Drake's ring that he wears around his neck that was originally owned by his idol, Sir Francis Drake, the famous explorer and privateer and slave trader. Makes him sound a little less cool, but whatever. The saying on the ring, Sic Parvis Magna, which means greatness from small beginnings, at least according to Nathan Drake, is a key item to the plot of the first Uncharted game. What's it doing here? Uh, who really knows? Given that the game exists in the game world, remember the PS3 has got Uncharted on it, I, I, I don't know really what to make of it. But hey, it's a fun callback to a previous series and obviously a cool find. At number six is Ellie's song cover. Another thing you can find in the downtown section of the Seattle QZ is an abandoned record store. You go up into the office, you'll find a pristine guitar in its case. 
after playing a little reprieve of Joel's song from the prologue, which is actually lyrics from the Pearl Jam song, Future Days. Pearl Jam also gets a shout out on a poster in the record store as well. Ellie busts out a cover of the perennial Easter egg favorite, Take On Me, by AHA. Now, we don't get to see her enter a black and white sketch world or anything like from the music video. Like, you're gonna have to do Just Cause 4 if you want something that elaborate. But, hey, an acoustic cover of the 1984 pop hit, still pretty darn good on its own. Oh, wow, that was, that was an interesting beat. And number five is the looking glass code. So there's this code you might've noticed that pops up in every game where you input a key code like 451 or 0451. And it's often one of the first codes you have to use in one of these games. It's a huge video game in joke at this point. The codes appeared in just a ton of games from Alien Isolation to Dishonored to Deus Ex Gone Home. I mean, it's literally everywhere. And unsurprisingly, given the fact we're talking about it, it shows up here as the code to the West 2 safe. What's the significance, you might ask? Well, the code first began as a recurring element in the games made by Looking Glass, the studio that basically created the immersive sim genre. Like, you know how you always hear, it's a spiritual successor to System Shock or a spiritual successor to Thief. That's where this came from. If you've got a game where you explore, find little details and environment, and are in any way immersive, you're probably at least partially following in the footsteps of Looking Glass. They also had a large number of locks and safes that required codes in their games. So a lot of games use that little thing as a nod, a little shout out. It's not like massively important or anything, but at this point it's a very long running referential joke. What have you got for me? At number four, this Frankenstein looking statue. After your first real encounter with the wolves at the school, you escape through some streets and you can find this gift shop, which contains some pretty familiar looking faces if you played the Left Behind DLC from the first game. A lot of the stuff you see is similar to things you'd see in the Halloween shop section of that DLC, like the statue, these masks, the little witch statue, all of it looks like stuff from that part. Ellie doesn't really comment much on it though, other than mentioning she's not a fan. It's probably because she's having a little bit of deja vu, but hey, we, we love the nods. We love them. And number three, the PlayStation Vita. During the game where you're infiltrating the Wolf's Ford base at the hospital, you'll encounter someone playing, well, in the immortal words of the guy we don't talk about anymore, Kevin Spacey. Yeah, I said his name. Is that a PS Vita? Yeah, the last of the PlayStation brand handhelds makes a kind of prominent appearance in the game. Not just that, but if you look at the screen, you can see that she's not just playing some random thing, it's Hotline Miami. Last of Us and Hotline Miami actually have a lot in common when you think about it. When you boil it down, they're both just sneaking around throwing bottles at people's heads and then violently killing them. Of course, there are some pretty big mechanical differences. However, it's nice to see one reference the other. At number two, a suspicious palette. At the end of day one, the game has a flashback to three years ago where Ellie and Joel took a trip to an abandoned natural history museum. After exploring the dinosaur and space exhibits, you can take a dive into a big pool of water, and if you look out over to the right, you might see something a little familiar. Yeah, it's a palette, just like the ones you used to use to ferry Ellie across water in the events of the first Last of Us. Obviously, now that she can actually swim, it's unnecessary, but they do comment on it. One of the only minor complaints about the first game were these palette puzzles that you had to do just a few too many times. So this is Naughty Dog just hanging a lampshade on it. At number one is the strange relic. Much later in the game, when you reach the Chinatown section, you'll find this thing in a room upstairs. It's just called the strange relic, but Naughty Dog fans or just fans of PS2 era platformers are immediately going to recognize this thing as a precursor orb from the Jack and Daxter series. These things have shown up as Easter eggs in pretty much every Uncharted, but this is the first time you find one in this series. There's of course no explanation for why it's here. It's just a little fun callback. It also leaves us to wonder what Naughty Dog is gonna do next, with Insomniac returning to Ratchet and Clank after a long hiatus, could Jack and Daxter be next for Naughty Dog? We're not holding our breath or anything, but who knows? I mean, those were good games. A couple of quick bonus ones that didn't really warrant a full entry, but are worth mentioning nonetheless. In the flooded section of the city, you can find an arcade that has, among other things, both the turning arcade cabinet that Ellie managed to play during Left Behind DLC and a Jack X combat racing machine, also from the Left Behind DLC, but also the last Jack and Daxter game by Naughty Dog, which is, as the name implies, a racing game. The last one is, is really dumb. One of the many superhero cards you can find is this one, Dr. Uckman. 
get it? Druckmann, like Neil Druckmann, the director of this game. Yeah, it's not the best pun you've ever heard, but it did actually make me chuckle the first time I heard it. So that's everything that we've got for you today. What did you think? Leave us a comment. Let us know. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. The best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe. Don't forget to enable all notifications. And as always, thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon Hero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.